You got them? Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. All right, take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Romans as we continue our series in the book of Romans. Good to see all of you here this morning. It was a beautiful day. I'm going to leave them up and not look through the top so you look all blurred, okay? So you can do whatever you want to do. I would never know. Okay. Romans chapter uh, 12 this morning as we continue our study in Romans. Thank you, TJ, for filling in for me while the two weeks I was gone and appreciated uh, Justinian teaching my class the second Sunday and Mike teaching it the week before that. And uh, glad all of you are here uh, this morning. Romans, talking today about Christian living. And before I left for vacation, we found ourselves in the beginning of chapter 12. We talk, we're talking about Christian living part one. And I said this, I said, you can't actually get into chapter 12 unless you also include chapter 11, verse 33 through 36. And so if we look at that again, if you back it back up there, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent, as he said, and he will, and, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Um, that is not the passage that I'm looking at. Now, I don't, okay, so I don't know what happened to my notes, but that is not, okay, it didn't do the whole book. Okay, let me read, let me read it. To, no, it's, it's not that. Let me read to you what it says. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. For he who has known the mind of the Lord or has become his counselor or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him, for of him, through him, and to him are all the things to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Is that what it reads? Yes. yes. Okay. You see, because of who he is and what we are not, because of that re re realization, that leads us into chapter 12. Because what we believe should impact how we live our lives. We should become so gospelized so that, in other words, so wrapped in the gospel that it impacts how we live. So gospelized that the gospels make such an impact upon my life of what I've learned that our doctrine changes our behavior. And so we saw in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where he says, present our bodies to the Lord. In other words, present all of us to God. Present your bodies. He's speaking about every part of you, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, all of you. You present it to God, and then he says, yield your mind to God, the renewing of your mind, because it begins with our thinking. It begins with our mind, with who we are. And he says, yield your mind and yield your will to God. That's so important in those first two verses. It starts with our mind, renewing our mind, yield our body to the Lord. Because of who he is and because we are because of who we are not, then he says, now present your bodies to God. Present your mind, be renewed so you think right, because your thinking and your mind is going to impact everything else, and yield your will to God. In other words, don't yield your will to selfish desires, but yield it to God. And you do so, as he says, because that is your reasonable service. And he's not talking about doing something that, well, that's reasonable. Like I said, you know, my dad goes off to work, when I was growing up, and he says, now, when you get home, I want the entire house painted. That's not reasonable. Steve, I want you to have the, house, the, the lawn mowed. That is reasonable. But that's not what he's speaking of here in this word reasonable here. He's talking about reasonable service because of his mercy. This is the least you can do because of the mercy of God, because of his acts of mercy, and it's, and, and it's an act of worship. So yield yourself, yield your mind, yield your will to God's will, not yourself. Then, in verses 3 through 16, it deals with our relationships with other believers. And Paul begins in verse 3, as we dealt with the Sunday before I left, on how we think about ourselves. In other words, that's where it begins. We, we, we say, think of others, but Paul says, think first about yourself. In other words, don't get puffed up. Don't think more higher of yourself than you should. We should start, we should start with ourselves, and, there, and there's a time when we need to look at ourselves and say, um, you know, where am I spiritually? 
Am I truly a child of God? Am I really saved? Do I really know the Lord? There needs to come that time in your life when you, you examine yourself. Have I really come to faith in Jesus Christ? Am I really a believer in Jesus Christ? Or am I, am I just putting my salvation on the fact that I've been baptized and I grew up in church and I've known about Jesus all my life and, and from the time I was born? I, there's never been a day, and I met a guy once like that that said to me, there's never been a day I didn't believe. I've always believed since the time I was, uh, since I, my parents are taking me to church. I said, well, that's fine. But have you ever, ever come to faith? Have you ever, ever come to the place where you ask Jesus Christ to save you? Well, I don't think I've ever had to do that, was the response. Well, you just don't hatch into being a Christian. You just don't grow into being a Christian. There needs to be a time when you truly examine yourself. Am I a person of faith? Have I really come to Christ in faith in Jesus Christ? And so there, that we start thinking about ourselves that way, but at the same time, we're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Because if we do, if we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, then that leads to pride. And pride leads to so many sins and so many problems in our life. So he starts off, because of who God is and, and who we are not, um, we need, to, we, need to, we need to submit ourselves to God. We need to submit our bodies to God. We need to submit our will to God and, and not think more highly of ourselves, but, but at the same time, examine ourselves to see where we are spiritually. And not only do we examine ourselves as far as being saved, but there's times when we need to look at our life and go, am I where I want to be? Am, am, I, am I where I should be? Am I living the life God wants me to live? Okay, yes, I'm saved. I know I've come to faith in Jesus Christ, but I'm, am I where I, I, I'm, I am supposed to be? Bob Zachary, that I said preached years ago at our family camp, said he asked every one of his kids when they turned 21, I want you to tell me why you know you're saved. I want you to tell me why you know you're going to heaven. I want to make sure that you truly have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Okay. So it starts with ourselves, thinking about ourselves, and yet not think more highly than we ought to. Well, today we begin in verse 4, and it deals more about how we relate to others. Because Paul was writing to Christians who were members of local churches in Rome, and he described their relationship to each other in terms of members of the body. That's the basic idea here, is that each believer is a living part of Christ's body, and each one has a spiritual function to perform. So let's start in verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And Paul begins here by using the human body as an example. The body is one, has many parts, but not every part has the same function. And the body parts might be saying, well, you know what? I'm more important than you are. For instance, the eyes are saying, hey, big toe, we don't need you. You're, you're a big toe on the end of that foot. The eye is important because we can see everything. And the big toe, if the big toe could speak, could say, oh, yeah, well, you can see my big toe. Let's see if you can tie your shoe without, or, or let's, see, let's see if you can walk well without your big toe. Deion Sanders lost his big toe and his second toe because he had a blood clot. And now when he walks, you can see a slight stumble there. He's not, he's not going to be able to play football the way he did when he, when he played pro football. That big toe helps with your stability. Or a thumb. Hey, you're just a big old thumb. You're a sore thumb. Oh, yeah? Hey, I, let's see how well you can tie your shoe without your thumb. Ever try to, to tie your shoe with just your fingers? You need your thumb to tie. And so all the parts are important. Then Paul says in verse 5, See, we too are one in the body of Christ and individually members of the body. And no one is more important than someone else. We have unity, but not uniformity. There is diversity, and I mean diversity in the right form, but we're not all the same. 
There's diversity in this building. We've got different ages. We've got different financial backgrounds. We've got different personality backgrounds. The body of Christ is made of people from, from Africa and from America and from England and from Europe and from Asia. And there's all different types of people made up within the body of Christ. We are, we are, there is to be unity, but not unified. And just think about how boring that would be if we were all the same. Example. Excuse me, Mark. Imagine if we were all this. Linda, I'm going to play a song. Everybody hitting the same note. Everybody looking alike. Everybody with the same gift. How boring a church would be. Would you agree to that? Amen. But what a difference. Everybody is different, but together there's harmony. And that's what God wants. He wants unity, not uniformity, where the body fits together and we're functioning together within the body of Christ. All fitting together. Each one has gifts that are important for the whole. And we need you. The body needs you. And, and Paul is going to discuss a portion of those gifts here, an example of how they should be done. A more fuller list is found in Corinthians, but he's just going to give us a, a sample here in this passage of how the body, how the church needs to work together. So follow the thought. He goes through the book of Romans, the first many chapters are about how we are dead in our sin. We can't save ourselves. We're under the law. There's nothing you can do that can bring salvation. He pushes us down so we can experience and be thankful for the grace of God. And then he goes into chapter 12, which is a transition from the theological standpoint of how we know we're saved to then how we live it, how we live out what we know. And so he starts with, again, presenting yourself to God, your body, your mind, your will. Don't think about yourself too highly. That leads to pride. And then he gets into how we deal with other people. And how we use our gifts. And then Paul says here in verse 6 through 8, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let, let us then, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. And he sh who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So let's break that down this morning a little bit. Look at verse 6. Having then these gifts that differ in order, in, in other words, each one of us have, have, have gifts, each one of us have talents, each one of us have abilities and callings. And he said, don't take pride in this because it's not from you. It's not what you've done. But notice as Paul puts it, it's according to the grace that God has given you. The gifts that you have to serve this morning is from God. It's not from us. And it's by his grace. And so he's saying, don't get all high and mighty about your gift. Don't get so full of pride over it. Don't think more of your, uh, highly of yourself than you should. And yet at the same time, don't underrate yourself. When we were down visiting my dad in Georgia just these past two weeks, there was a man who used a cane. He's in his 90s, had to be. They had a beautiful grand piano in, in the building next to where you would go in to eat. And at dinner time, he would be out there and he would be playing some of the most amazing, by memory, music. I mean, he's playing songs from, from Broadway shows. He's playing every genre of music. He's just beautiful up and down the keyboard, just playing away. We stood there. We even danced. Do it. Yeah, it's just, it was beautiful. Just absolutely amazing by memory. And I went over, Karen and I went over to him and I said, that is amazing. You are so good. He said, thank you. As he kept playing, he said, I, no music? And he said, no, I got it all from memory. But yet, I can't remember if I went to the refrigerator yesterday. <laughs> His mind was gone, but boy, he could remember. God had given him that gift and he just, he played. 
Well, my sister has visited down with my dad, and Kathy plays the piano well. And so we're sitting there, and one of the guys said, so, do you play the piano like your sister? I said, even better. <laughs> I didn't. That, that, that was the extent of my piano right there. But, uh, you know, everyone's got their gift, and they're to use it. And the thing is, my sister would admit, and that man would admit, that the gift that they have, they may have developed it more and practiced it, but the gift came from God. Amen. What you have comes from God. Don't take pride in it. But then note, notice what Paul says. Then use it. Don't set it aside. Don't let them spoil. Use what I have given you. And use them to build up the body of Christ. Use them for the benefit of others in the church. Don't use it, as I'm going to read to you in a moment, to build up yourself or to build up your own platform but, and, and say, look what I'm doing. But rather, use it as God has gifted you. And don't use it just to make yourself feel good, but use it as, as, I, have, as I have gifted you. And so Paul mentions these gifts in just this portion. And the point is this. Our gifts are to be used to edify and build up. Now, there's always a caution here with our gifts because many people think they have a gift when they actually don't. And that can be tricky in a church. Sometimes baking is not a, it's, that's a pretty easy one. Someone says, I have a gift of cooking. And then you taste their food and you go, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. And then other people will cook and you're going, yes, you do. That is amazing. And I want more of it. Singing, you get really in trouble with that one sometimes. Someone says, I've got the gift of singing. And the whole church is going, no, you don't. And if you ever watched American Idol, one of those voice shows, you know at the very beginning when they're doing the auditions, they let people on for the entertainment value. But you're, if you're listening to them, you're going, no, I'm sorry. Uh, your family might have said you got the gift of music, but uh, it hurts my ears. Uh, David Jeremiah said you need to have the heart and you need to have the art uh, if you're going to sing on the platform. He said it's got to be able to get past my ears to get to my heart. The gift of teaching is a touchy one because people have say, I've got the gift of teaching, and, and no, you don't. John MacArthur said he faces that a lot with students who come out of master's college, and they'll go up to him and say, um, I've got the gift of teaching, and I want a class. And he'll say, no, we will, our elders, our deacons will decide if you have the gift of teaching or not. If you can truly explain the word, do people really want to hear you? Do you have that or not? Some people think they do, and... And they don't. They have it because they want to have it. And it's not because they actually have it. And even then, it's got to be a, you know, it needs that, that kind of gift, as John MacArthur would point out, needs to come, come under the approval uh, of that leadership and, and be done with the right reason, right purpose as well. But he's saying, if, you, if God has given you the gift, a gift in the church, use it. He says, if prophecy, prophecy then prophesy. It's a gift to speak out the truth. That's what the word term prophecy means. It's, it's the, gift to, the gift to speak the truth of God for the edification and instruction of, the, of God's people. To speak truth. Then Paul says in verse 7, or ministry. Let us use it. Let us minister to people. In other words, if your gift is serving others, then serve them. And serve them well, is what he's saying. Serve other people. Again, illustration from, from Georgia. We're sitting down there, and we go in to eat, and there's this long table, and my dad and, and Ruth are sitting there, and these other men are around our table, and a lot of them are there for, for, for obviously, some of them for, for uh, mental capability reasons, others for health issues uh, that were there around that table, and we sat with them at all the meals. Well, they have these servers that stand back in the back. So you have these different, different, two different eating times and these different people sitting at these different tables. Um, you know, I met one man that I, that I really came to love. He was 92 years old. Um, his mind is not, not there at, totally. And, um, you know, I think it took three days for me to tell him where I was from. And where are you from? Every day was the same thing. And where are you from? At that time, and finally, when, finally, when he got it, we had this great 
conversation. He was 92, served in Korea as a, was a Marine, and uh, we, had a, we had a good time together uh, talking with him. But we were sitting there at this table, and the rule was that the waiters were at the back, and if, if you needed something, you raised your hand at the table, and they would come to you. If you needed a refill of coffee, you would raise your coffee cup, and they would come and refill it, or your water glass. I said, this is great. I'm going to do this when I get home. And Karen sat at the end of the table, and I said, so Karen, and all the guys were listening, I said, when we get home, I want to sit at the dinner table, I want you in the kitchen. And every time I need something, I want to raise my glass. And one of the older guys across the table said, yeah, and she needs to come like that. I said, exactly. (laughs) We said, she said, yeah, let's just see how well that works when you get home. (laughs) Well, that's not the kind of service I'm talking about, okay? That's not it. But the point is, if you have the gift of serving, serve. Minister to people. And don't do it half-heartedly. Do it heartily. Do it well. This is the gift of putting shoe leather to the gospel. This is something everyone should be doing. But for those that are gifted in that area, and we know that there are people who are very gifted in serving and ministering. That just, it just flows easily with them. They're so good at it. If that's you, then do it. You've got a special grace and, and do it and do it well. We all should be serving one another, but there are those who specifically and especially have, have a gift of service and ministry. Then Paul says, he who teaches in teaching. And again, this is the, the gift for the purpose of explaining the truth of God. Being able to explain clearly what God's word is saying. And then Paul says, he who exhorts. And exhortation. Now, this is different from teaching and, 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 and being a prophet, because while teaching and preaching focuses on the mind, exhortation focuses on informing the heart and the conscience. It's an encourager. It's closely related to ministering, but you're being an encourager. The person with the gift of encouragement can cause the listener to, to be convinced about doing what the Word of God says. It's that person that, that's, that comes along and comes up to a friend and says, Hey, you're my buddy. Did you hear what was said today? Did, did you understand what you read? I want to encourage you to do what's right. I want to encourage you to, to live out what you believe. I want to encourage you to get back on the right road. Hey, listen, you're, you're, you, you know you're going on the wrong road here. Teaching has one goal, but exhorting and being being someone who who, who is an encourager has the goal of action and transformation. And and, and, and it's it's helping a a brother or a sister when they're they're grieving, when they're going through moments, when they're going through stress, when they're going through anxiety, and you're aware of it and you're encouraging them in their walk. You're helping them take the message or the word that they just read and live it out. In fact, another way to look at this gift is that we come alongside people who are hurting or weak or discouraged and and we encourage them and we comfort them. And we all know that there are people who have that gift, don't we? And he says, if you've got that gift, use it. Encourage people. There are those people in the church that just are natural encouragers, and they are a joy to be around. They comfort you, and they lift you up, and they help take the load off. And they give you a word of encouragement that when someone says, well, I don't know what to do. Hey, let me help you. And they're just they're the person you call to when you're, when you're down, when you're discouraged, when you're hurting, when you're grieving. If you have a gift of encouraging, comforting, then Paul says, then do it, use it, encourage, comfort. It doesn't mean if you don't have the gift of encouragement, you don't encourage anyone, and you simply say, well, that's not my gift. (laughs) No, we're all called to be encouragers. It's just that there are those who have that gift, and they are, are definitely to use it. Use it in the body of Christ. We, If there was ever... A gift that's needed in the church, in the body of Christ, is this one. I mean, they're all needed because we all fit together. Just imagine, again, a church, if if the church is filled with all encouragers, but there's no one ever saying the truth of God's word. This is the truth. 
or teaching or whatever it might be. But if there was ever a gift that, that's needed to function in a church today, it's this gift of encouraging where people come along and encouraging. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, it says this, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Are we not living in hard times today? You go back to the beginning of that verse. Let us consider one another. Let us, in other words, let us take a look at our wife, at our husband, at our friend, the ones we sit around, our, our family and friends, and consider where they're at so that I might help stir up love and good works in them. I want to encourage them. That's what Paul is saying. And then Paul moves on to another area of ministry here, and he speaks about the another branch of gifts, and they are gifts for the extension of the ministry. For instance, in verse 8, he says, he who gives, do it liberally. In other words, those who give, don't be stingy. And then this next gift is for those who, with the gift of, of leadership or organization and administration. He said, he who leads, do it with diligence. In other words, if you lead, be diligent about it. Don't be lazy. And then he says, he who shows mercy, do it with cheerfulness, with joy, with a joyful heart. In fact, I want to I summarize this section for us this morning by something that Dr. Tony, Tony uh, Ameridia wrote in his great book on Christ-centered exposition in the book of Romans. And he, and he writes this. He says, so God had given a measure of grace and faith to each member of the church, each believer has thus been gifted, but we should not think too highly of ourselves when it comes to these gifts. Rather, we should be humble and faithful stewards of them. Gifts should not breed arrogance. After all, God sovereignly provides them. We have not earned them or received them because of our good deeds or superior value. God drew us to faith by his grace and has given uh, and has, and has given us spiritual gifts, therefore, he gets the glory. We need to have our minds transformed by his grace in order to keep up, to keep us from self-promotion and self-exaltation. We should assess ourselves soberly and use our gifts to serve and bless others, not as a means of building our own names and platforms. So he says, so serve and do it with a joyful heart. Well, then Paul moves into about our relationships to other believers. And he basically, here, he's talking about how our attitude is important and how we use our gifts. Because it is to be seen and felt in a loving part participation. Look what he says in verse 9 through 16. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, but of the, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Now, Various headings have been given to the, these verses, such as marks of the true Christian, or love in action, or Christian ethics. Whatever title we give them, it is very clear that, that Paul gives us a string of exhortations that were and are countercultural. It is a list of attitudes and actions that come as a result of a Christian allowing the gospel to so shape their life in their relationship and in their ethics. And that's why I say again, you could use the word gospelized. I have let the gospel so impact me and shape me that it impacts what I do. And we see here how the gospel is to be worked out in our daily life. We see how the gospel then is to be lived out in our life of God's people. And, and these verses, for the most part, are not difficult to understand at all. But are they difficult to apply? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. 
And that is why we need to let the gospel permeate every aspect of our daily lives. Having our minds, it goes back again to the beginning, having our minds renewed by the Spirit of God or else we are not going to respond the way Paul's pointing this out to us. Our minds have not been renewed. Because a renewed mind leads to a new way of, of thinking and a new way of living, and it involves attitudes and actions that are not conformed to this age. And if you think about it, the old mind or the mind that's not been conformed or renewed to this age wants to do the opposite of these instructions. If you really think about it, the old mind wants to, wants to act this way, but a renewed mind acts the way God wants us to. For example, the old mind sometimes leads to a, a fake love. Instead of, as Paul says in verse 9, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Be able to say, I love you, and understand what those words mean. I love you. Again, I, I mentioned the pastor that spoke last week in Cleveland. I told my class about it this morning that uh, he was talking about how long he, that, that him and his wife had been married about 23 years and he had grown up wanting to go to Clemson. They, they were in college together and, and he said, I loved her and she loved me. And we both understood what the word love meant. But just because we loved each other didn't mean we were going to get married. He said, the only reason we are married today is because I did what? I asked her. He said, we could say we love each other all day long, but he said, the reason we're married today is because I finally said, will you marry me? And she said, yes. And we could say we love Jesus all we want, but that doesn't make us saved. A person has to say, Lord, will you save me? Come into my life and save me. We need to ask. And some people, we, 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 we understand love, and then there's some people who don't have any idea about the meaning of love at all. He said, don't, don't fake it. Don't pretend, as the world does, but really mean it. And then, also, the wrong thinking says that we support and do what is evil. And instead of, of, of verse 9, where it says, hate what is wrong and hold tightly to what is good. Hate evil. Not the person. We're going to deal... In fact, next Sunday morning, we're going to come back to verse 9, and we're going to look at verse, from verse 9 to verse 21 all in one because there's so much more here that ties it all, ties all together. But verse 9 says, hate what is wrong and hold to what is good. And then Paul says in verse 10, again, this comes from a right thinking, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. And then the world says, serve self, not the Lord. Rather, in verse 11, it says, don't be lazy. Work hard. Serve the Lord. Do so enthusiastically. See, the world way of thinking says, live for yourself. Serve self. Think of yourself even more than you should. But Paul says, no, we serve the Lord. We live for him. Verse 12 continues, says to continue to rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Don't stop. In verse 13, he says, when God's people are in need, what should we do? Be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. In verse 14, bless them who persecute you. Don't curse them. Talking about that person, the, the, the neighbor who just drives you crazy. Anybody got neighbors like that? Oh, my neighbor is just like, they're a thorn in the flesh. That guy at work, a kid at school that keeps persecuting you. He says, don't, don't curse them, bless them. The world says retaliate, get back at them, get even. God says don't do that, bless them and pray for them. Then in verse 15 he says be happy with those who are happy, weep with those who weep. That's where the encouraging part comes in. Be happy with, weep, be, when, when someone's rejoicing, rejoice with them. When they're weeping, weep, for the, weep with them. Verse 16, live in harmony with each other. Live in harmony. We are one in the body of Christ. 
And again, if there's anything that Satan wants to, dis- wants to ruin in a church or in a body of believers, it's that, that unity. Amen. Not uniformity. There's diversity within the, in the true understanding of that word within the body of Christ. But he said, I want unity. I want the body to be one. And Satan does everything he can to rip that apart. Amen. Everything he can to rip that apart. And if we're not careful without realizing it, we can be one of the tools that Satan's using to gradually rip that apart. And we need to say, God, I want to stay humble. I want to yield to your will. I don't, want, I don't ever want to be a part, any, any way, shape, or form, part of ripping that unity apart and letting Satan use me. He says, live in harmony with one another. Because when the non-reformed, when a non-renewed mind is, it conforms to the world, then that's where the complaining and the criticizing and the gossip and the division that creates this unity in church splits, that's where it comes apart. When that mind has not been renewed by the Spirit of God, and that's why, again, Paul goes back to the beginning of it all, that yield your mind to the will of God because that has such an important part in everything else that that follows. And then in verse 16, he says this, Don't set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. In other words, don't be arrogant and don't think you know it all. That's basically what that means. And many of you know people who are know-it-alls. They know, they, they know it all. When I was in Bible college, there was a table... And this one guy always sat in it. Nobody was ever sitting at that table. And I was a freshman, and I go in, and I was sitting with a bunch of guys, and I go, how come every meal this guy's sitting by himself? He said, because nobody wants to sit by him. Why not? He's a know-it-all. You bring up a subject, and he knows all, everything, about everything. Every sport, every doc, everything. He'll give you his opinion. Nobody wants to be around him. He's a know-it-all. Paul says here in this verse, do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. And that is why we need a renewed mind. And the way we need, and why we need the Holy Spirit to make us different. We need a heart that's saturated in grace. In other words, to live out the instructions that God gives us in his word. Because again, what you believe should impact how we live. Again, as we study the book of Romans, it's so easy just to take a chapter or a verse and preach on it without understanding the full text, without understanding the full book of what's going on, of why Paul is been, has been building the, 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 the believers up in their faith through, through 11 chapters, and then he gets to chapter 12, and he says, Now, therefore, because of who he is and who you are not, this is how we are to live as a believer. And it takes a renewed mind, and that comes through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, change my thinking from where I was or where a a carnal believer might believe to where you want me to believe from your word and help me to live it out. Important passage. And that's why next week when we get, we're going to look back at verse 9 again on this thing about love. And as we go look at it all the way through verse 21 of how you treat one another, how you treat your enemies, how you treat those um, in our life. And then in chapter 13, he gets on into governmental issues and through the rest of the book. So I hope this morning that, that you take these, these thoughts today and say, Lord, help me. Change my thinking. Change the way I used to think about things. Change the way how, how, I, how I've thought about people and, and, and how to genuinely love them and, and how to, to use what you've given to me and and. and and live for you, live for your glory. Father, I pray this morning that you would help us in our walk with you. Lord, I pray that we will be the believer you want us to be. I pray, Father, that you would guide us, help us to uh, follow you in our life. 
and uh, be a church that you, you can use for your glory. And we ask this in your name we pray. Amen.